You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. Whether it's for food, fuel, drinks, or snacks, about half of the U.S. population shops at a convenience store every day. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. So imagine a day when customers plan before they go to your stores. They plan because they want to know what you have in your store, what you have that's available, and they want to know everything about your operations before they set foot inside that store. That day is now here, and we're going to talk to an expert about how you can take advantage of this trend. Welcome to Mies Matters. My name is Jeff Leonard with Nax. And I'm Carolyn Schneer, also with Nax. Thank you for joining us. Um, just like we have for the past few months, we're recording at home. So, Jeff, we're on, what, our 11th week or so here. It's the end of May and uh, 2020, and um, we're excited to be here. But just know that you might hear some dogs, some kids, somebody barking, trains barking. You never know. But please excuse those little noises. We're still here for you. I'm going to have some fun content. And let's start off by introducing our guest, Joe Bona. He is principal and founder of Bona Design Lab, and he's been on the show before. So welcome back, Joe. Thanks, uh, Jeff and Carolyn. Great to be here and um, great to, uh, uh, would have been nice to be virtually together, not virtually together, but uh, physically together, but it's uh, always great talking to both of you. Hopefully sometime soon. But uh, till then, we are seeing that people are gathering, going to stores, but um, it is a little different. They, they want to know a little bit more about things before they get out of their car. And um, safety and comfort have become much more important. We've seen that in consumer surveys where um, when we look at new technologies or new uh, adoptions of things like um, curbside or delivery or things like that, the importance of convenience is almost matched by the importance of safety. And that's probably not a trend that's going to go away. So um, starting out, Joe, just talking about the idea of how do you communicate some of the safety protocol um, and, and you're serious about it when somebody goes in your store, the idea of sanitation stations and how might they evolve from those first initial things that we saw where it's a standalone piece that you just got from uh, you know, that, that already existed to something that may be more complex down the road as, as safety continues to be important. Yeah. You know, I, I've been um, sort of scouring the web and just trying to see what, I could find from what other folks might be doing around the world and so forth. And, you know, you come across, you know, different things that, you know, people are experimenting with. And um, I, I found an article. I, it was a, um, a city in Holland where McDonald's opened up and they sort of created this uh, hygiene station. And that sort of got me thinking, um, you know, as part of a new normal. Um, and, and they did it, by the way, in a very professional, it wasn't uh a piece of plastic that they, you know, screwed onto a piece of wood and put a, you know, sign that says, um, you know, cleaning station or, you know, something. It was, it was like, it was there always from the day that they opened, uh, very sort of professionally done. And, um, and it was a place where they had uh, a, a little sink, a little, uh, hand sanitizers and wipes and a little place to dispose of it in a, in, in a very simple, but professional, um, piece of communication that just sort of explains that, you know, they would prefer to ev have everybody as they come in to, you know, wash their hands. Um, and, and also as they leave. And, and I thought to myself, you know, geez, you know, maybe these are the kinds of things that we'll see going forward where, you know, just putting something like that front and center, I think starts to communicate to people that that particular store is safe. They care about safety. And it's done through design. <clears throat> you know, I, it's not, you know, right now we're in a scramble and, and everybody's trying to do the best they can. And so we've got, you know, um, we've got um, painter's tape on the floor to tell us where to stand. We've got paper signs telling us, you know, six feet apart and all these kinds of things. And, you know, here's the first attempt that I was able to find where it felt a lot more integrated. Um, and it was it was thoughtfully designed and it looked like it was just there, as I said, from the beginning. And, and I think these might be some of the new norms that as we take safety and hygiene into uh, consideration and they become really part of our everyday offer, I think consumers will, will look for this <clears throat> in most retail environments. And, um, and yeah, and I, and I think it's just how we execute um, <clears throat> and to give people the confidence that, you know, we're serious about safety. 
Do you think you mentioned something, Joe, about um, with the painter's tape on the floor? And um, I've seen you go, like even evolve in the last, you know, however many months we've been home from you go to a grocery store and where it was painter's tape and then it came like a real strip of something designed. Um, do you think that someone would ever integrate something or maybe even different countries or here in the United States integrate that into the actual like floor tile? Or do you think this is something that may just be temporary? Um, no, I, you know, I think, I, I think having something integrated into the floor tile is certainly, <clears throat> certainly something worth um, considering, you know, and the layouts always change and fixtures move around. And so you, you know, I guess maybe the long, the flexibility part of it, but I, I think maybe more than floor tile, you know, I was thinking if we can sort of, you know, maybe queuing systems become a bit more focused and intentional. And, you know, if you think about convenience stores today and, and, and many legacy stores in particular, the checkout counter is located right up against the front window, uh, whether on the left or right side, and the front door is also on that front elevation. And so if you think about people coming in who are paying for gas, getting cigarettes, uh, they're going from the front door right to that counter, um, you've got people who are going to the cooler and getting their beer or water, and they're walking back to that point. Um, and then you've got people who have already paid and are exiting. And so you sort of see where that potentially, um, whether you've got tape on the floor or floor tile designs of six feet apart, that area of congestion I could just see where it, it would be really difficult to maintain, you know, six foot distance. And so, you know, if that pay point was moved maybe a little further back in the store, we had a queue system where you can guide and direct people from the beginning uh, on that trip uh, through a normal queue, then maybe a little bit of separation starts to become a bit easier. Organizing people through the space becomes a bit easier and more organized. Um, and so I think that layout could actually serve a pretty important purpose going forward and how we think about social distancing and, and how we make sure that we're organizing traffic inside the store, uh, foot traffic inside the store in a, in, a, in a reasonable way that sort of promotes safety and, and, uh, and social distancing without being so blatantly obvious. I mean, the tape eventually is going to go away, um, but the thought of social distancing might not, it, it, whether that's long term you know, uh, or short term, I, I don't know, but I, I certainly think in the near term, um, it's not going to go away. So it's just, you know, uh, you know, how could we sort of take a look at layout um, organization of, of key components of the layout and then queuing systems to maybe help us um, with navigating people through our space? And does this, when you look at layout, uh, certainly some of the things that we've talked about, the, the tape on the floor, the directional signs, maybe one-way aisles, whether or not that works in convenience stores, those are all things that you're seeing um, right now. And some of them are done very well. They don't look like um, some of the things that that we've all seen where it was just handwritten stuff. And it's, right. it's um, but as this evolves, there will be, uh, there, there's some things, I guess the way I'll ask this question is when, we, when you look at layout and of course, as a designer, you look at everything differently than I think other people, because you're looking at opportunities as much as anything. So there are simple things that you can do with layout in an existing structure. And then there's, Hey, we're going to build a new store that incorporates some of the things that we see going on today. Now it's not something you can do overnight, but how do you look at both elements of layout where here's some, here's some things that we might be able to do now, and these can be effective, but when we build this next gen store, this really gives us store, gives us the ability to tell a really cool story about how do we tie in some of these things, whether or not they're still around in a year or two, how, you can't predict a future that you don't know is there. No, certainly not. And, and, you know, it's, you know, I, I kind of always hate the word flexibility because it's just really difficult to, you know, know what you need to be flexible for. And, and our stores aren't that big. And, and so we've got four walls that define the space. And within that, there's a lot, a lot of permanently installed elements that just aren't going to get moved overnight. So to your point, and in, in existing stores, you're not, not going to start moving checkout counters and things like that. Um, but having said that, I think things like thinking through a queue line and, you know, moving gondolas, um, you know, requires a bit of effort, but it's not the worst thing in the world. And so in, a, in existing environments, I think if you sort of uh, keep all of the perimeter intact and think about everything in the middle, 
um, how can I reorganize and how do I want people to navigate the store and how do I promote safety? And, you know, does a queue help? Um, will that sort of relieve some of this uh, social anxiety over distancing and, and queuing and things like that? And, you know, how might I use a queue system to uh, sort of get integrated into an existing um, uh, layout and then sort of, you know, fill in the rest with your gondolas as, you know, as, as need be. So I, I think from a, an existing standpoint, there's ways of sort of taking a look at it and, and just thinking about how to promote safety. And, and then obviously, as you consider, um, I think it may be a little while before people get back to building new stores, but uh, at some point they will. And, and I think there, you know, people will be looking at these kinds of things much more seriously. I think, um, you know, as we were, have been talking a lot about technology over the last couple of years and touchless payment and all, and all of those kinds of things, I think people are going to be talking about safety and hygiene and social distancing um, as part of a new norm going forward. They'll be just as important as, as any other consideration. And so I think it'll be a lot easier when you're dealing with new builds because you got a clean piece of paper and you can organize things in a way that makes sense. Um, but I think short term, it's trying to be a little flexible um, and, and then just seeing where the opportunities are to sort of rearrange the furniture um, and perhaps <clears throat> adding a, a, a queue system that might help, um, as I said, promote some of these sort of safety issues and, and social issues that people are concerned about. Now, Joe, talking about moving, you know, furniture and, and things that aren't like fixtures that might not be able to be mixed here's or moved i'm sorry um one thing that i was thinking about the other day and i want to ask you about doors um i've mostly been going in and out of grocery stores um you know big box stores when i need to go out i haven't been going to small businesses they haven't even opened yet where we are here in northern virginia on this day but i did need to go to um a ups store to pick something up and there's one door one door in and that's it you go in and out the same door now i both me and this, this customer were coming out at the same time. I was going in, she was coming out and we both looked at each other and she's like, do I hold the door for you now? And do I just, so like, she ended up just kind of like shoving it. So it just kind of opens up and you're like, so even the social norms that you're used to of holding the door for somebody, because it's a way of just connecting with that person. And I know there are some C stores out there that 10 years or a year ago, we said, oh, it's the best idea. You open the door, the next person has to help it and thank you. And now you've made someone day, someone's day because you were nice to them and you did that common gesture of holding the door for them. But now it's like- You can't even uh, see their smiles because they have a mask on. That's true. There's so many things there. So is there any um, either guidance or thoughts you've had around just doors and how do you make those kind of cues work these days? You know, it's funny. We, um, <clears throat> I thought about this a little earlier. We- um, you know, some of you may remember many years ago, we, we did some work in Canada for a concept called Neighbors, where we actually had a, a sort of an Ikea uh, type layout where you had one entrance point um, and you had a separate completely exit point. And so it really sort of forced you to navigate the whole space and it sort of eliminated those issues. And I was thinking, gee, you know, if you were to th you know, fast forward and think about the situation now, that's almost kind of, you know, a situation where it would really sort of work so well now because you would avoid those kinds of problems. But but obviously, you know, separate in and out are going to be very challenging in existing stores. But, you know, there are usually a double set of doors. Um, you know, maybe they ha it's a matter of simply, simply um, putting a railing on the inside and a railing on the outside. One door swings in, one door swings out. And, you know, you sort of create this imaginary in and out. Um, and you, you change, it, yeah. yeah, you change the the, the swing uh, so that one door is in only and one door is out only. And even though they're together, uh, you kind of create this way of suggesting to people, okay, you enter on the left, you exit on the right, or however the, the layout works. And um, yeah, that might be one simple way of doing it without spending, a, you know, a huge fortune Um uh, of creating a whole new storefront. And design, as a design firm, you're in charge. And by the way, Neighbors was a cool concept. I remember remember seeing all those pictures back then and saying, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, you design very big projects, or when I mean big, um, you know, ground up projects. But design also involves telling, talking to your client about what if and and walking through how you might do this or how you might do that and some of it could i, I suppose even be about uh, how do you 
launch a more extensive online presence or things that are non-store. Are those elements that you're increasingly looking at in, in how do you advise somebody in design that there's also the idea of showing them the store before they even go to the store, whether online or um, windows or something like that? Well, I think two things. One, um, I was reading today in the um, Next Daily, there there was an article about Starbucks announcing more locations with more drive throughs And, you know, I think, you know, to some degree, you know, our industry has talked about drive throughs for so long, and it always seems like it's the next greatest thing. And then it just kind of, you know, sort of goes by the wayside. And I, I know people have used... Uh, successfully drive-throughs, but it's never really sort of taken off and, and, you know, in a, in a, in a large way, but, you know, um, those may be opportunities to, um, I, I think you will see more online ordering. And so the question becomes, do people want to go in the store to pick it up? Are they more comfortable being in their car, going through a drive-through window? Um, it, you know, do we have to start considering walk-up windows just because people don't want to go in the store to pick it up? And, and then how do you create those opportunities where you're using design to sort of not have a little hole in the wall where a hand comes out and takes your money and, and then, you know, passes you your, your, your order, um, but in a way that sort of brings the inside out and you, know, you do that with bigger windows is it you know is a better storytelling with graphics you know what are all those things that that we could do to sort of make those feel like an extension of the store but i i think online for sure will continue to play a big role uh whether curbside pickup or walk-up windows or just click and collect in the store. I think those will all, all be areas that will continue to, to, to grow. And, and as people, you know, get more concerned about uh, coming in contact with other people, I think, you know, some of these things will be looked at the, um, seriously and, and, and closely and, and, and we'll see what sticks and what doesn't stick. Well, and I think you, um, you make, you bring me to another point too, which is when we are all comfortable or allowed um, to go in, to a place and stay there and eat. Um, right now where I am, we haven't even opened up to where we're allowed outdoor seating um, at restaurants, but soon, I think Friday. But then um, at some point, we're going to get back to where we want to go sit down in a store. I don't know how soon that'll be. I don't know how far away that'll be, but we're going to want to sit down at a restaurant or a quick serve restaurant or somewhere and eat. Um, so as seating areas right now, I've seen some in other countries where they literally take painter's tape and close off every other table or take the table away or do something like that. Now that that's fine for now, um, but it's not very aesthetically pleasing. And as you go further a few years down the road or a few months down the road, even um, there's got to be some ways to reinvent that seating area. Do you have any suggestions or ideas for looking further down the road to make that so it's not just a Band-Aid effect of, okay, now you don't sit next to each other, but Here's how to make it so that someone's comfortable and wants to sit there and be distant. Yeah, it's maybe a combination of things. Um, you know, we, we um, probably won't have the same capacity issues that I think restaurants do. I, I really empathize, empathize with a lot of the restaurant chains because I think they're going to, you know, a lot of the business models, and maybe not so much the chain stores, but, you know, certainly more of the high-end restaurants will really struggle because their business models are based on, you know, filling seats and, and turning tables. And if you not got half the capacity, um, that will be pretty problematic, I think, for, for many. Um, our industry probably survives less on, on seating uh, and turning tables. Um, but having said that, I think they will be under some scrutiny and regulatory um, uh, issues where they will have to limit the amount of people seating or, or have some sort of distance in between tables. And um, and you're right, we could just remove a lot of tables, but then it looks like a big empty space and you're half out of business. And so, you know, how, you know, what could we do with design that sort of enhances um, this idea of separation, but in a way that sort of is part of the overall design. And, you know, we've been looking at things from architectural screens um, that, you know, floor to ceiling uh, that are, you know, really beautifully designed and, you know, maybe there's some uh, combinations of materials. So it's not just this, you know, piece of plastic or glass that's floor to ceiling, but, you know, combinations of wood and cutouts. And um, so it provides this divider. Um, and so if we've got tables every so many feet, 
that these dividers provide some of that separation, but at the same time, it just feels a lot more natural and that it was intentionally designed that way. And so, you know, we're taking a look at things from, you know, dividers on tables uh, that maybe have, you know, brand messages and graphics. So again, it's not that cheap piece of plastic that's you know, nailed to a, a two by four, um, but things that are just done in a tasteful way that reinforce the brand messaging, that reinforces the, uh, uh, you know, some of the design and the storytelling that's already going on, or things that are just architectural, they're just part of the vernacular of, wow, this is really a great store. And um, you don't think twice about it. It's not a divider anymore. It's just, it's just where you go to sit and it becomes a cozy little place. Um, so those are the things that I think we'll, we're going to take a look at as we think about seating uh, and anticipating that there'll be less, less capacity. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, I think it will be important to make sure that those areas feel legitimate and, and authentic. And, you know, we didn't just sort of, uh, as I said, get a two by four and some nails and, and, um, and screws and, and put together a piece of plastic and then throw them in between tables. I think that's not what people, people sort of expect that now is the short term, um, you know, situation that we're in. But I think long term people will want to see something that's a bit more credible. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think um, I, I saw you recently on a, uh, a webinar um, through a Global Convenience Store Focus um, uh, with uh, Insight Research over in the United Kingdom with Dan Munford. And he you, you had some design ideas and you showed some pictures of some of these um, when you were giving your presentation. So um, it looks really cool. It doesn't look ob obtrusive. Like you said, it's just like, oh, look, I'm just going to go sit in this nook. And, you know, the, the nook is just really keeping you or them away from, from other people. So um, if you get a chance listeners go ahead and check that out it's um global convenience store focus dot co dot uk but yeah you've got some really cool pictures of that of the drive throughs ideas that you had and the cues for drive throughs because if people are driving up to your store um you don't want them just blocking lanes of traffic but you know they're coming through that way too so you've just got to think about different things and it really expanded my my thoughts on on the ideas that you just talked about here yeah. And, um, let me, um, that, that's something that I was thinking of asking. So perfect setup. Thank you, Carolyn. Of course, um, Jeff. The, the whole idea of queuing, we've talked about queuing inside the store. Um, but queuing when you have a car, car takes up a lot more room than people. And we have cars all over the lots, but, um, it used to be two weeks ago, uh, we thought, well, you know, people aren't going to be driving cars anymore or four weeks ago, wherever it was. But recently I've seen articles that um, people might embrace cars, their own personal cars as personal you know, safety transportation um, vehicles, I guess, which it is. Uh, and we're seeing things like rental cars are down, um, the use of ride shares down, et cetera. Um, and, and thinking about how do we do queuing, because if people are pulling up to curbside, if they're pulling up to delivery, if we have all these maybe more people in cars waiting, how do we look at parking in those issues? And, and exactly what you had just mentioned, Carolyn, I remember in the fall uh, driving home from work and just a huge traffic backup. And I thought there was an accident and finally, you know, got past it and we were okay. And then the next day, same thing happened. And I told somebody, I said, yeah, there's this huge, I don't know what this deal is. It's right by Popeye's. And it's like, oh, I just figured that one out. They just introduced their sandwich, huge lines, um, difficult to manage. So how can we look at some possible queuing um, scenarios that might play out related to the vehicle? and people expecting to be able to park, to be able to wait for things. And I'll do this on a relatively small lot. Are there opportunities there, Joe? Yeah, that's that's a good point. And, um, you know, our sites weren't designed for all of this kind of activity. You know, a lot of these sites were designed, you know, even a year ago, none of this would have been six months ago. None of this would have been at the top of our mind. So even new sites that just opened um, certainly didn't have any of these considerations. And so that that's a good point. And, you know, obviously with Hertz uh, falling bankrupt, 
see and, and, and Uber and trouble. And you're right. People are looking to their own vehicle as their own sort of safety cocoon as they, you know, travel. Um, I even think in New York here, subways and, and buses and things, uh, I, th- I think might even see ridership down and, uh, at the expense of craziness on the highways. But, you know, I, I, uh, we use maybe one, um, one example to answer the question. Um, we've got a, a local restaurant that after, you know, four weeks of cooking in, in how, in, in the house here, uh, we just got so fed up. We just needed to find some place that could cook a meal for us. And, and we just dawned on us one of our sort of favorite local place, Italian places. I was open for, for delivery. And when you go online, you get their menu and so forth. And they say, when do you want to pick it up? And I'll be there in 20 minutes. They say, no, not going to happen. Uh, how about 35 minutes? And so I'm guessing they're trying to manage the kitchen um, by the amount of orders and so forth that they're, and they're trying to spread it out and space it out in a, in a, in a relatively easy way for them. And so maybe things like that. And, you know, obviously we're convenience stores, be, by definition, we want to be convenient and we want it now when we want it, you know, but it may be that, you know, timing and things like that are going to be things that we'll have to put up with as part of the new normal. And so to avoid craziness on our lot and, and just confusion and mass a sea of cars and, and, and those kinds of things, it may be that, you know, when you order that they just have to spread those out a bit. So, you know, everybody's not just coming all at the same time. That's obviously for online and, and, and pre-ordering. It doesn't help uh, with those who just uh, want to be in their car now and all decide to, uh, you know, go into the site at the same time. It certainly won't, won't help that kind of a rush. But, you know, it, you know, it occurred to me that perhaps, at least for the online ordering and stuff, there may be ways of sort of using sort of time slots to kind of spread and uh, spread some of that congestion out a little bit. Um, you know, whether that uh, works in an ideal world, I, I don't know. It sort of goes against the definition of what a convenience store is, but. That's an interesting point. I mean, I go, I stagger out when I go to the grocery store now. I'm like, well, let's see. I'm going to go. You stagger out when you go to the grocery store? What have you been doing? Well, (laughs) I stagger my times for when I go to the grocery store. (laughs) Well, the worst thing is, is I go at like seven in the morning. So thankfully, I I promise you, mom, I'm not staggering out of my house at seven in the morning. So, um, but I go early because I don't want to bump into people. And I, I had, I hadn't really thought of like what happens when you're in a impulse industry like this, where you're like, I just need this now, or I'm on a road trip. I'm going between here and there and we ought to go now. So um, that's a whole different discussion. We can talk about the restrooms, which we'll pick up another day. So maybe we can have you back on again sometime, Joe, and talk about what happens while you're inside the store on these special times. Um, but for now, let's, um, if you don't mind telling people where they can find you, you um, where you are online or see some of your really cool ideas besides the website I gave earlier. Oh, sure. Our website is uh, bonadesignlab.com. And um, if you go there, it will give you all the all the propaganda on who we are and what we do and have some examples of, uh, of our recent work. Well, as always, it's a pleasure talking to you. I know we have John a really long time ago, but we're not going to let that gap go on again. So hope to hear back from you pretty soon. Joe, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate um, you coming on the show with us and uh, hopefully next time we can do it in person. And in the meantime, thank you for listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nax and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information, visit convenience.org.